Well, Wig, you did a, Will, you did a good job in selecting songs to go along with our lesson tonight on the book of Revelation. And by the way, if you would be interested in coming to our class on the book of Revelation, we begin that class on Wednesday, the first Wednesday of October in the SOC room. Uh, it's a class that generally uh, the older folks come to, our senior citizens, but uh, anyone is welcome to come. And we have generally had members of other congregations who have come to be with us for that class. And we're looking forward to it. And as we begin that class, we're going to have a meeting at 11 o'clock and there are going to be some sandwiches and various other things to eat as we sort of fellowship for a little while and then we'll start our class. And when we do that, we'll review five of the seven churches that we've already studied. And then we'll have two to go on the seven churches, Philadelphia and Laodicea. And then we'll start with the throne scene in chapter four and move through the rest of the book of Revelation. So tonight I want to talk a little bit about five sobering reminders from the last book of the Bible. Reminders. The Bible is filled with reminders. The book of Deuteronomy in the Old Testament is a book of reminders. God said to his people, Israel, don't forget. Over and over he said, remember. When Peter wrote his epistle to the scattered Christians who were suffering, he said, I write these things to you by way of remembrance. That is, he's reminding them of some very important things. Revelation is an interesting book. It's the capstone of divine revelation. It's the grand finale of the Word of God. It's a unique book in so, so many ways. First, it's a climatic book. It's the climax of the Bible. What began in Genesis is finalized in God's sovereign purpose in the book of Revelation. It's a majestic book. The songs we've sung tonight, and this last one was very new to me, but it's a majestic book. It, the emphasis is upon God's holiness and God's throne. In fact, the word throne is found 46 times in this book. How appropriate that the dominion, the glory, the holiness, the sovereignty of God would be the focus of this climatic book. But it is also a wonder book. I've been told, I've never calculated it, but I've been told that more commentaries have been written by scholars on the book of Revelation and the book of Romans than any other book of the Bible. I would suspect that is true because the book of Revelation is a wonder book. Bible students who come to it prepared by time and effort with the rest of the Bible and I want to emphasize with the rest of the Bible, with the great introduction from the Old Testament and all of the information we are given in the New Testament, when you come to Revelation with that background and it's in your mind, you will be filled with wonder and amazement at the workings of God throughout history. But I want to show tonight that it's a very relevant book. Now, sometimes we steer away from it, sort of like some books of the Old Testament, you know. The prophets are not studied as much as other sections. The book of Leviticus is often neglected, and so is the book of Revelation. But I want you to see tonight that its message is very timely and timeless. I want to give you five sobering reminders from this book that's as important as they've ever been. And these reminders aren't new. In fact, they're found throughout Scripture. But these inspired truths should never, never, never be forgotten. Now, what is the first one? The first one is the power and the majesty of the Christ. The Christ, the Messiah, promised from the Old Testament. As he is described... Here in the last book of the Bible, 
You see, we serve the living, holy, powerful, majestic Christ. So let the church always recognize that Jesus is the head of the church. He has all authority. The church is privileged to be his spiritual body. He is creator and he is redeemer. John said all things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made. Paul in Colossians 1 said, in him doth all things consist and he is before all things, creator and redeemer. He is in Revelation described as the lion of the tribe of Judah. Now that's the image of dignity, of power, sovereignty, courage, victory. He's the root of David. Revelation 22. That connects him with David. And Matthew in his genealogy speaks of the 14 generations from Abraham to David and then from David to Christ. Christ is the root of David. He's the Lamb of God. Don't you thrill every time we sing that song, the Lamb of God. Jesus is described that way 28 times in the book of Revelation. He is called the faithful and true witness. So he's on the throne. He's on the throne tonight in heaven. He's not in a manger. That was at his birth. He's not on a cross. That was important and fulfilled God's plan from the beginning. Nor is he in a tomb. He's on the throne. He's won the victory. He's ascended and exalted in heaven. What encouragement that would be to these suffering saints to whom John addressed this letter or this book to the seven churches of Asia at a place in the Roman Empire where the suffering was the greatest at the time. What encouragement to know that Jesus had his eye on them. He's living for us. He's the living Christ. He, he intercedes and acts tonight on our behalf. Isn't that encouraging to all of us? He intercedes. He acts as our advocate. He's our attorney. He pleads our cause. He translates our prayers to God. And when we don't know exactly how to pray, and there are times in our lives when we wonder, how can we find the words we want to express them, but we cannot find the words where our heart is right with God. I believe that Jesus Christ, our intercessor, takes those prayers to God. I believe the Holy Spirit intercedes for us, as Romans 8, 26 says. So he's there receiving praise as the saints are ascribing worth and praise to his holy name. So Jesus in Revelation is praised because, number one, who he is. He's the humble, submissive, spiritual, sacrificial lamb, powerful, majestic lion, the son of the living God. We praise him because of who he is. We praise him because of where he is. He's on the throne. In fact, he's on the right hand of the throne of God in heaven. And we praise him because of what he does. He receives the petitions and the prayers of the saints. He serves as our intercessor and advocate. What a friend we have in Jesus. We praise him because of what he has, power, strength, and glory. So that's the first great thing that captures my imagination. It reminds us that the church can never be more than what Christ is to us. Let me repeat that. The church will never and can never be more than what Christ is to us. He's the source. He's the substance of our faith. He's the reason for our being. And as the song states, he is our everything. So the church, God's saints, are to honor, praise, exalt, 
and proclaim him. That's the first reminder from Revelation. Here's a second reminder. The authority and finality of the word of God. And that would seem to be a great theme of the last climatic book. That word, which is God-given and spirit-filled and verbally inspired in Revelation, is called, number one, the sayings of mine, 22 verse 9. His commandments, 22 verse 14. The testimony of Jesus, 19 verse 10. And the faithful and true witness. The authority and finality of that word is impressed in the closing words. These words of the book of this prophecy includes Revelation, but in principle includes all of the Bible. And we're taught at the beginning, in the middle, and at the end of the Bible not to add to it, nor to take from it. That is, we are to be true to it. To add to is devastating. God shall add to him the plagues that are written in the book, chapter 22. If any man shall take away, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city. You see, the authority and the finality of his word is a reminder that always be foremost before the church. It's serious business whenever any one of us tampers with the word of God. This is a sobering reminder. What are we to do with the word? We're to love it. We are to honor it. We are to exalt it. We are to obey it. If you really want to know what our attitude ought to be toward the scriptures, there's no better place in the Bible to read than Psalm 119. Every verse in that Psalm, it's the longest in all the Bible. 176 verses and every one of those mentions God by noun or pronoun and every one with the exception of three mentions the word of God and so God in his word is the theme of that great chapter and if you ever feel like you doubt the word of God I don't know of any part of the Bible that will build your faith in what it is and what it does like Psalm 119 so it's serious business. God says to us, don't you pervert it. Don't change it. Don't try to modify it. Don't mutilate it. Now here's sobering reminder number three. The saints of God are involved in battle. And only those who patiently persevere will triumph and win. If we follow the Lamb, chapter 14, whithersoever he goes... We shall triumph, for the Lamb has won the victory. The word overcome is found throughout the book, 12 times in Revelation. Let me give you some samples of the word overcome. We're not to be overcome, but we are to overcome. In fact, Paul said that in Romans 12, be not overcome of evil, <clears throat> but overcome evil with good. Here's some verses, 2 at verse 7. To him that overcomes will I give to eat of the tree of life. You recall the tree of life was in the garden of Eden at first. Man lost the tree of life and access to it by sin. Now it's removed in heaven and man can partake of it through a savior. Here is another verse. 2 verse 11. He that overcomes shall not be hurt of the second death. Now, what is the second death? The first death is our, the separation of our spirit from our body. When that occurs, death occurs, physical death. But what is the second death? The second death is the eternal separation of the soul from God. And that will be that abyss, that eternal death. Here's another verse, 2 verse 17. To him that overcomes will I give to eat of the hidden manna. 2 and 26. He that overcomes and keeps my works to the end, to him will I give power over the nations. 3 at verse 5. He that overcomes, the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life. 
and I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. Three at verse 12. He that overcomes will I make a pillar in the temple of my God. Three at 21. He that overcomes will I, will I grant to sit with me in my throne. 12 and 11. They, that over, they overcame him by the blood of the lamb. This is speaking of the beast. That which represents evil in the book of Revelation was overcome through the blood of the lamb. We have two great resources, the word of God and the blood of Christ. And then at verse, verses, uh, verse 7 of chapter 21, he that overcomes shall inherit all things, all things. Now, here's the fourth sobering reminder. And this is something, I think, in our culture that we need to be reminded of. And that is the reality and the awesomeness of God's wrath. Now, I know that we often emphasize God's love. And that needs to be done. You know, John said, love. Perfect love casts out fear. But I, want, I, want, I believe the Bible teaches that fear is a real and wholesome motivation for us to serve God. The writer of Hebrews said, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. So we need to understand that. Revelation simply corroborates what the Bible teaches from Genesis that God is a God of judgment from Genesis all the way through the Bible. Look in the Old Testament. What do you see? God judged the world of Noah's day. And that flood was an evidence of God's judgment upon the antediluvian world. God judged the great cities of the plains, Sodom and Gomorrah. They were prosperous cities. Read Ezekiel chapter 16 and you'll see five contributing causes of Sodom's fall. But God brought that judgment upon those cities of the plain. God judged his own people, Israel, time and time again. He permitted Assyria to come into Israel and uh, captivate those people. And Assyria spread those people all over the world. God permitted Babylon to come upon Jerusalem and the streets, Josephus said, ran with blood because of that judgment. God has judged nations. In the Bible, we see God judging Egypt. God judged Assyria. And later on, God judged even Babylon, whom he had used to judge his own people. And that was the dilemma that Habakkuk the prophet felt and dealt with in that little book that bears his name in the Old Testament. You see, God judges within history. Will God judge America? You think about that. God has judged nations within our time. God judged nations in the Old Testament. God judges within history. But listen, his final ultimate judgment will be beyond awesome. True and righteous are his judgments. Revelation 16, verse 7. God's wrath in Revelation is great. Note, it is said to be poured out. God's wrath poured out. God's wrath caused men to marvel. Chapter 15, verse 1. But here's one thing about God's judgment. It is righteous. It's right. Whatever God does is right. And when God judges man, there is no alternative. And it's always righteous. God's wrath and revelation causes men to marvel we must be reminded frequently that our God is a consuming fire. Fear is a legitimate incentive in serving God. And let's be reminded of that tonight. And here's the fifth one. 
And this is a sobering reminder. And that is the glorious reward of the eternal city. The city for square. The city with foundations whose builder and maker is God. It appears to me that in the Old Testament, Abraham longed for that city, we're told. There wasn't nearly as much yet revelation given in Abraham's time. He was very limited in the amount of information he knew about it, but he longed for that city that had foundations whose builder and maker is God. Paradise lost in Genesis can become paradise regained in Revelation through a Savior. Sin caused us to lose it. The Savior enables us to gain it. Sin marred the image of God. God made us in his image. But sin marred that image in man. But Jesus came to bear the sin of man upon the cross. And Revelation ends with a reference to the grace of God. Chapter 22, verse 21. But here's one of the most beautiful things to me. And that is, Revelation ends with an invitation. Now, you think about that for a moment. Man being what he has been, what has but been? Sinful, rebellious, disobedient, depraved in mind and body throughout history. You would think that God would just write us off in the final analysis. But he does not. Chapter 22, verse 17. The Spirit, that's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, every time the invitation of our Lord is extended, the Holy Spirit is inviting. The Spirit and the Bride. The Bride is the Bride of Christ, the church. One of our great prerogatives as the church of our Lord is to extend that invitation of Jesus wherever we go. When the gospel is preached, the invitation Come to me, and I will give you rest. The Holy Spirit invites, the church invites, Christ invites, Christians invite, whosoever will. That invitation is not limited. It's to whosoever will. That is, whosoever will respond. Whosoever will answer the revelation, it is come. Let the hungry eat of the bread of life. Let the thirsty drink of the water of life. Let the lost come to the tree of life. Whosoever will. It's interesting to study some of the invitations in the Bible. Like Isaiah chapter 55. You know, and many other passages. Matthew chapter 11. The invitation of our Lord. All you who labor and are heavy laden, come and I will give you rest. But isn't it remarkable and isn't it by his grace that the Bible ends not with a blanket condemnation, but with hope, with an invitation from our Lord. Indeed, we sing how beautiful heaven must be. Five sobering uh, in, uh, reminders from the last book of the Bible. Tonight, if you're here not a Christian, be reminded, reminded of these things about God's eternal purpose. And what better time than in an assembly like this tonight, you would simply walk out into the aisle and to the front and say, I want to confess my faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the living word that gives substance to the written word. I want to confess my faith. I want to be obedient to the gospel. I want to repent of my sins. I want to be buried with Christ in the watery grave where I contact that blood, the precious blood of the lamb that cleanses. And then I want to rise to a newness of life transformed by his amazing grace. What better time than right now as we stand together?